Good morning to each and every one of you. Hope that you are having a wonderful Sunday thus far. First Timothy with me in your Bibles, please. First Timothy is where we're going to go back to. First Timothy chapter 6 is where we are this morning. We're only going to be looking at two verses of Scripture this morning in First Timothy, verse number 11 and verse 12. So that is where we are. I hope that you have been keeping safe and that you enjoyed your, your Easter holidays and that the children enjoyed their Easter time off as they head back to school tomorrow. First Timothy chapter 6 is where we are. I'm going to read our text, verse number 11 and verse number 12. And the word of God says this. It says, but as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, fight the good fight of the faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. The title of this morning's message is Press On. Let us pray. Our God, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we have the opportunity to come together, to worship together, even though we're in separate places. And Lord, we thank you for your word that you've given to us. And I pray that you would use me in a special way this morning as I speak. Give me clarity of thought, speech. Help me to declare your message to your people. And I pray that when all is said and done, that you would receive the honor, the praise, and the glory, and that your people would be edified and built up and better able to execute a life that is able to glorify you. Help us. Help me. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. In decades gone by, in countries and in locations where there has been significant British influence, there is a popular manual that has been used in order to help uh, children learn English grammar and comprehension. This tool is called the Royal Readers. And in this book is a poem with the title, Persevere. And here's how the poem goes. It says, quote, drive the nail aright, boys. Hit it on the head. Strike with all your might, boys, while the iron's red. When you've work to do, boys, do it with a will. They who reach the top, boys, must first climb the hill. Standing at gazing at the sky. How can you get up, boys, if you never try? Though you stumble oft, boys, never be downcast. Try and try again, boys. You'll succeed at last. When I think about this poem, I think about something that adequately and accurately describes the perseverance that believers in the Lord Jesus Christ need to have if they're going to live the victorious Christian life. And in our text here this morning, Paul addresses his young ambassador, Timothy, once again. And he wants Timothy to understand the important principle that not only Timothy must understand, it's a principle that every believer must understand. And that principle is this. Perseverance is indispensable to the Christian life and walk. There are two things that I want us to see this morning from this passage of Scripture. The first thing that I want us to see is, number one, the Christian must always pursue. Virtuous character must be the goal of every single saint of God. Look at verse number 11 there. It says, but as for you. Now, let's stop there. The most important word in that clause there is the word but. But shows contrast. But shows a difference. Now, obviously, the you there is a re reference to Timothy. So Paul is going to show Timothy how he must be different, how he must contrast from those he described earlier. So it says, but as for you, O man of God. Now, the term man of God is used some 70 times in all of Scripture. The overwhelming majority of these times, maybe around 68 of these times, it is actually used in the Old Testament. There are a number of people in the Old Testament Scriptures who's referred to as being a man of God. 
Moses gets the title. David is called a man of God. Samuel is also called a man of God. Both prophets, Elijah and Elisha, are called men of God. And there's even an unnamed prophet who's called a man of God as well. The term man of God can be better explained as the man who is from God, the man from God, or even in a possessive sense, God's man. And it means that he is sent from God and has the authority from the almighty God to execute his ministry. Therefore, Timothy's role is similar to the Old Testament prophet, and he's called by God to do battle against the Ephesian false teachers. Paul affirms to Timothy yet again that his authority for ministry is not self-endowed. It doesn't come from within himself. Timothy's authority comes directly from the throne room of heaven. So then Paul tells Timothy, he says to flee these things. Now notice the language that is used there. He doesn't just say to remove yourself from these things. Paul doesn't say, Timothy, separate yourself from these things. That's not what he says. He says to flee these things. The word flee means to escape quickly or to seek safety in flight. I don't know if you've ever watched a video maybe on the internet or, you, or you've watched the news and seen some kind of active scene of a police car or the guardy chasing uh, another vehicle and they're flying down the motorway. Or if you're watching an internet video, they're flying down a highway and there is a police car or police cars, plural, in pursuit, hot pursuit of this one vehicle that is trying to elude them for whatever reason. That car that is trying to elude the police, that car that is trying to get away from the police is what you should think about when you hear this word flee. They're not just gently walking away. They're not just gently moseying, moseying on down the road. They're actually blazing out of there. That is what Timothy is supposed to do. He's supposed to flee these things. Now, what are these things? Well, it is everything that Paul addressed in the previous section of chapter 6 from verse 3 all the way down to verse 10. So these things refers to the corrupt doctrine, to pride and conceit, to controversy and quarrels, to slander and dissension, to discontentment, and also the love of money. All of these things are what Timothy is being told by Paul to escape from. And this is what you and I need to escape from as well as God's people. These things are hindrances. These things are hurtful. They don't help the cause of the gospel. They do not build up the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's interesting that I note in this text here that even though Timothy is called a man of God, which is a big compliment, by the way, Paul still feels the need to tell Timothy to flee, flee these things. You would think that if Paul calls Timothy a man of God, that he would not need to tell him to flee these things. But Paul does tell him because Paul recognizes that even though Timothy is a man of God, a man sent from God or God's man, he is still a man nonetheless. And as a man, he is still fallible. He's still capable of making the wrong move. And we as people of God are in the exact same boat. You and I, we are still fallible. We are capable of making the wrong move from time to time. It was Alistair Begg who said, the best of men are men at best. I'll say that one more time. The best of men are men at best. We're all in the same boat that Timothy was in. Therefore, we must take heed to the words of scripture. The Bible is for each and every one of us. And we must all take its warnings seriously as Paul warned Timothy. He tells him to flee these things. But the very next imperative gives us something else. He says to pursue. That's the word there in the text, pursue. Now the word pursue means to run after someone or something with zeal, 
So in that image that I just gave, in that illustration that I just gave of the police car or cars chasing an individual, I want you to think about the police cars themselves who are trying to do the catching up, who are going after the thieves or whoever the individuals may be in the car that is trying to elude them. When you hear the word pursue, think about the police car. Think about the guardie when you hear this word. As a matter of fact, in the original language, this word pursue is so intense that sometimes, sometimes in our English Bibles, it's also translated as to persecute. That's how intense this word is. It can also be translated as persecute, as in the apostles were pers persecuted by people as they went out into the world and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to every creature. So what is Timothy to pursue? Well, Paul goes on to give a list of six virtues. And these are what Timothy must pursue. And these are what you and I as God's people must also seek to pursue. First of all, righteousness. It says there in the text. Now, what is righteousness? Well, it is integrity. It is a purity of life. It is rightness and correctness in thinking, feeling, as well as acting. It means to behave ourselves according to God's will and in a way that pleases the almighty God. And for the record, each and every one of these virtues can only be accomplished through the regenerating work of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit in our lives. In other words, if you are truly, sorry, you cannot be truly and genuinely righteous until you are saved by Jesus' blood. In order to be saved, a man or a woman, a boy or a girl must come to the end of himself, must come to the end of herself and realize that as sinners, they are totally and completely separated from God and can have no friendship, can have no communion, can have no fellowship with the almighty God that created the world. And only through casting yourself fully on the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and abandoning every other form of hope can someone be saved from eternal punishment as a result of God's wrath. So before someone can show righteousness outwardly, they must first seek the righteousness that only comes through believing on the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation. So my question to each and every one of you this morning is, have you received that righteousness? Do you have the righteousness of Christ accredited to your account? In Romans chapter 10, verses 1 and 4, here's what Paul says. He says, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, them is Israel, is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God, meaning God's righteousness, and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not submit themselves to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Folks, there are only two kinds of people in this world. There are people who are standing on their own righteousness and there are people who are clothed in Christ's righteousness. Either you're standing on your own righteousness or you're actually clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If you're standing on your own righteousness, you're in problems because you have to be absolutely impeccable, 100% perfect in order for God to not pour out his wrath on you and place you into the flames of hell for all eternity. But you're, if you're in Christ's righteousness, in the clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, God sees you as perfect as he sees his sinless son. So you're either one or the other. But if you are clothed in Christ's, Christ's righteousness, my second question to you is, are you also pursuing righteousness? Are you pursuing a correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting? There is no other option for anyone who is a child of God. We must be pursuing righteousness daily. We must be chasing after it. The next virtue there in the text is 
godliness. Now, godliness is just a general sense of piety. It's a life that is fully consecrated to God. It is, if I could create a word, it is God-likeness. Godliness, God-likeness. That's my word. I don't think that's a, an actual word, but I'll create it for the purposes of this sermon. This is what Timothy must pursue, and this is what others must see in his behavior. And this is what others, especially unbelievers, should see in my behavior and in your behavior. When people think of my life, when people think of your life, do they think about a life that is fully committed to the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we more commit committed to Jesus Christ than we are the things of this life, the things on the peripherals? Jesus should be number one and we should be committed to him. Do others see our behavior as similar to what God's behavior would be like? Do they see us as being God-like? Not that we have perfection, but when they think of us, they think about qualities that are also consistent with what they know God to be like. Now, for the sake of information, the difference between righteousness and godliness is that usually when we speak of righteousness, usually, not all the time, but usually when we speak of righteousness, we talk about the actions that a person does, if we exclude the righteousness of Jesus Christ out of this conversation, of course. However, godliness, on the other hand, refers to the default position or the, or the character of an individual. So righteousness usually speaks to the actions that a person does, whereas normally godliness speaks of a person's character. So are we pursuing godliness? And I should also ask, are we pursuing the things that will make us godly? Because godliness is not just something that's automatic. It doesn't just happen. It's, just, it's not just, voila, ta-da. No, godliness doesn't work that way. We must pursue godliness. We must put ourselves in situations and we must accept opportunities that will cause us to grow in godliness. That's the purpose of what we're doing now. That's the purpose of our Sunday morning service, so that you can grow in godliness. That's the purpose of our Thursday night prayer meetings, so that you and I can grow in godliness. This is why we have youth meetings on Friday nights over Zoom. It's so that you can grow in godliness. This is why we're going to start Sunday school again. It's so that you young children can grow in godliness. This is why the ladies have a Bible study every other Tuesday. It's so that we can grow in our godliness. That's why we encourage the reading of good Christian books and authors. Because that is the means whereby we grow in godliness. Feeding on the right spiritual meals will increase my godliness, will increase your godliness. And this is something that we must actively pursue ourselves. Each and every individual Christian is responsible for pursuing this themselves. Godliness is not automatic. We have to pursue it. The next virtue in the list is faith. Now, in the New Testament, the word faith can have either one of two ideas. The first idea is believing, trusting, placing your confidence in something. The second idea of faith in Scripture, especially in the New Testament, is the concept of faithfulness meaning reliability, meaning being trustworthy. So believing, trusting, faithfulness, reliability. So which is it here when it says faith? Well, I believe it is trusting and believing God daily. You see, all of these virtues are intended to be linear. And when I say linear, that means you don't just, you're not just supposed to exercise this virtue once. It's supposed to be exercised repeatedly daily throughout the course of your life. That's a line. That's linear. So we're supposed to be pursuing these things every day. Timothy is going to need to be a man of faith if he is going to fulfill the call that God has for his life individually. And every believer needs to learn to exercise faith if they're going to live a victorious Christian life. Each and every one of us has to learn to exercise faith. We need to learn to trust God. We need to learn to rely upon God. We need to learn to place our confidence in our almighty 
God, not just for salvation, but every day so that we can fulfill his purposes for our lives. Hebrews eleven six says it this way. It says, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. You won't always know how things are going to turn out. You won't always know what the end result will be when it comes to life. And sometimes you just need to take a step of faith. Sometimes you just need to take a leap of faith as long as you know what you're doing is not violating biblical principle. There's more than one individual in this church who serves as a missionary to the Republic of Ireland, the great Republic of Ireland, God's country, as they say. More than one individual. Most of us have never had any experience of living in Ireland before we came here. We may have had a brief visit, but we had no experience of actually living here day to day. Most of us. We didn't know what things would be like when we came to Ireland. We didn't know how things would turn out. But we felt that this is what the Lord wanted from our lives at a certain time. And so what did we do? We exercised faith. We left our jobs. We left our homes. We left our families. We left our churches. And we put our lives in God's hand. We trusted God with our lives. And we moved to the Republic of Ireland. For most of us, someplace far away. It's not one or two hours. It's, a, it's very far away. But I think most of us would say that we're doing okay. We're, we're doing quite fine. You see, it takes faith to live the Christian life and to please our God. One minister said it this way. He said, faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the entire staircase. That's what faith is. Putting it all in God's hands and trusting him. The next virtue on the list is love. Love is an affection of goodwill or a commitment of devotion that causes one to do what is favorable towards somebody else, even in the midst of varying circumstances. So what Timothy should be pursuing is love with all people, both inside the church as well as outside the church, both the saved and the unsaved. His goal should be to love everyone as God does. And that should be my goal. That should be your goal as well, to love everyone as best as we can in the way that God would love them, whether they're inside the church or outside the church. Now, inside the church, we must treat our brothers and sister, sisters with dignity and respect. That should be our default setting. You should always want to do what is beneficial for them. Now, sometimes as churches get larger and as things grow, that becomes more easier said than done. But that is what we should be pursuing as the people, as people of God. And also outside the church, it should be no different. Unbelievers should feel the love of Christ exuding from our existence in spite of their situation. Even though their lives may not match up to the biblical mandate, even though their lives are not what we think they should be as Christians, we should still love them. Timothy had to wrestle with some antagonistic enemies in Ephesus. These were false teachers, but never once, not one time, would Paul have approved of Timothy hating his enemies. Scripture teaches in the Gospels that we are to love our enemies as hard as that may be. And I must tell you, that is hard. Sometimes that can be even hard. That can be hard to do in the church because sometimes depending on what kind of church you're in, you may feel like there are enemies within your own church. That can be hard. But the biblical mandate, the biblical standard that we must be pursuing is to love everybody, as hard as that may be. So do we love those who are the people of God? And also, do we love unbelievers, those who aren't the people of God, those whose lives may not be what we know they should be according to God's standard? We ought to be people 
of love. And the next virtue is steadfastness. Steadfastness comes from two words in the original, to remain under, to remain under. In other words, to remain under the load, to remain under the pressure. This is patience. This is endurance. This is, here's our word, perseverance. That's what steadfastness is. Timothy must persevere in order to fulfill his ministry. And the Christian life demands perseverance. As a matter of fact, to be honest, life, just life, plain old life demands perseverance. The Christian life demands extra perseverance. Things won't always be easy if you're trying to serve the Lord. Things will get difficult at times if you're trying to live to the honor and glory of God. There will be temptations. There will be trials. There will be shortcomings. There will be discouragements. But you cannot give up. I cannot give up. If you're a child of God, you have the comfort of the promise that the Lord is on your side. As Hebrews 13 verse 5 tells us, he has said, meaning God, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. It was Charles Spurgeon who once said, by perseverance, the snail reached Noah's ark. We must persevere as God's people. I'm not sure who I'm speaking to this morning, but I'm sure there's someone who needs to be encouraged to persevere this morning. Don't you quit on your children. Don't you quit on your marriage. Don't you quit praying for unsaved loved ones. Don't you quit. Don't you quit on your education. Don't you quit on your sanctification. We must persevere. Steadfastness, perseverance is a major chunk, a substantial piece of the victorious Christian life. And then the sixth virtue on this list that Paul gives Timothy is gentleness. This is the only time that this word is actually used in its original form in the New Testament. And I think we all know what this word means. It means to not be cruel or harsh or maybe even disgusting with other, other individuals. It's treating people tenderly and softly. So Timothy was to treat everyone gently. But we must remember we must remember that Timothy was in a situation in which he had antagonistic enemies. And so Paul is telling Timothy, even towards those false teachers, while you're standing firm, while you're opposing their false doctrine, Timothy, make sure that you're also gentle. Now, I think most of us would consider ourselves to be a gentle people. I, don't, I think the average person considers him or herself to be a gentle individual. However, the challenge comes. The challenge usually comes when people are not so gentle with us. I know that's where I struggle. If I can be transparent, I'd be the first to admit. It can be a struggle to be gentle with those who are not gentle with you. But that's what the standard is. That's what God wants from us. That's what we should be pursuing. This is precisely what Paul wants from Timothy. And this is precisely what God wants from you and myself. So do we treat people harshly and cruelly, or are we treating people with gentleness through thick and through thin? Number one, we saw that the Christian must always pursue. Now, number two, let's see that the Christian must always persist. The battle must always be fervently fought. Verse number 12, there in our text still, 1 Timothy 6, it says, fight the good fight of the faith. Now, the word fight here in both instances, in the first fight and the last fight, comes from a word in the original from which we get our English word, agonize, agonize. It gives you a sense of what is expected. This is a struggle. You must put forward your best effort in order to win. This is a grueling exercise. In other words, struggle in order to do your best to win the prize. Every Christian's, Christian has three primary enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. 
and they all work together to do what they can to hinder the progress of individual Christians, and they all work together to do what they can to hinder the progress of Christianity as a whole. Therefore, the child of God must wrestle and struggle to overcome these enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. This is what I have to do. This is what you have to do on a daily basis. It's not easy, but this is what we must persist in doing. The reason the Christian life always feels like it's always a battle is because it is a battle. We as believers, we don't serve on a cruise ship. We work on a battleship. Therefore, we have to put forward the effort to fight and to fight well. If we don't fight, however, we most certainly will be overcome by our enemies. We must fight this fight as best we can. We must agonize. It's grueling. It's torturous. It's, it, it, it takes energy, but we must do it because this is what the Christian is called to do. And then it goes on. It says, also, take hold of the eternal life. Now, the phrase take hold here means to, to, to seize something or to hang on to something. Do you remember in scripture, in the Gospels, when Jesus Christ was walking on water and the disciples saw him walking on water and they, they were afraid. And then Jesus Christ said, it's me, your savior. And so Peter says, Lord, if it's you, bid me come on the water so I can walk to you. And Jesus told Peter to come. And so P Peter put his foot on the water and he began walking on the water as Jesus Christ was there standing on the water. And the Bible says he began to feel the, the wind and he saw the waves and he became afraid. And when he became afraid, he began to sink down. And when he sank down, Jesus Christ took him. Jesus Christ seized his hand and prevented him from going down into the water. That word where Jesus Christ grabbed his hand and took him is the word take hold here. It's the exact same action. You're supposed to seize. You're supposed to grab something, hang on to something. So what is Timothy supposed to seize, according to our text? It's eternal life. It's the everlasting life that Jesus gives to all who place their faith in him for salvation. So Timothy must continue to persevere in his life and ministry, and he must make a full grasp of eternal life. He must make a full grasp of everlasting life. In other words, take ownership of this, Timothy. This is what Jesus Christ has given to me. This is what he has purchased for me on Calvary. It is mine. I have it. I'm going to embrace it. I'm going to hold on to it. Not as if you're going to lose your salvation because you can never lose your salvation, but you're embracing everything that your salvation entails. But the text says something else about this eternal life. It says it is that to which you were called. Now, what is the word call here? It's not like calling someone or ringing someone on the phone. The word calling here is an effectual call of God upon somebody's life. This is when God draws an unbeliever to himself and saves him, making him a child of God. This is the drawing of God. There are many examples of this in scripture. John 6, 44. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless... The father who sent me draws him. Romans 8.30. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And then 2 Thessalonians 2.13 and 14. Paul says, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, Beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. And then he says, To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So just as Timothy was called to eternal life. Every believer has been called to eternal life by God. That's how you're saved. 
No Christian is the first cause of his own salvation. No Christian is the first cause of her own salvation. God is the first cause of every Christian's salvation. He did the calling. He did the drawing. This is why God deserves the glory alone for our salvation. Not your parents, not your Sunday school teacher, not your church, not your pastor, and certainly not yourself. God and God alone did it by himself. And this should make us humble as believers. What makes us from any unbeliever out there stumbling on the road drunk? There's only one thing that makes us different. It's the grace of God coming upon our life and saving us so that we would not be like that individual. This should keep us humble. It's only by his grace that we're not homosexuals, that we're not bank robbers, that we're not murderers. It's only by his grace. And if his grace had not existed upon us, had not been granted to us, if he had not called us, we would be no different than some of those people out there. And then the last part of the verse says, about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So the good confession here is a public confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and a testimony to the fact that one is a converted child of God. And he made this public confession. It says there in the text, in the presence of many witnesses. In other words, there were a number of people present when he made this public profession of his faith in Jesus Christ. So when or did he make this profession? Well, there are actually two possible answers to this. Number one, it could have been done at Timothy's baptism, because at a baptism, that is what people normally do. It's what we do today usually, and I suspect it's what would have been done in the first century, in the early church. That's the first option. The second option is that it could be the commissioning service, or as we may term it today, the ordination. So baptism or the commissioning service. Which was it in this situation? I cannot be 100% sure, but as an individual student of God's word, I lean more toward the commissioning service. And the reason I lean more toward the commissioning service is really because of the fact that so far, two times in the same book of 1 Timothy, the commissioning service is mentioned twice. It's already mentioned. So I think since it's already mentioned twice, it makes sense to have it mentioned again because it fixed the context of 1 Timothy. Baptism is never mentioned in this book, so I don't think it's baptism. However, those who would take the position of baptism could, may not be wrong either, because it could be either of these, but I go with the commissioning service. So what's being said is that Timothy must persist, and he must seize this eternal life, to which he also gave testimony before a number of witnesses. Perseverance, pursuance, persistence is non-negotiable for all those who are the saints of the Lord Jesus Christ. The story is told of this young man who was wandering down this lonely road And as he was wandering down this lonely road, he came to a point where he met this man sitting under a tree, an older gentleman. He had this nice, long, gray beard, and he looked wise. And the young man said to the older gentleman, he said, sir, I need you to show me the way to success. The older gentleman said nothing. He just continued to look at him with that blank stare. And the only thing he did was this. So the young man went and walked in that direction. After a few moments, the only thing that could be heard was splat. So the young man came back. As he came back, he had two bruised knees. And he said to the older gentleman again, sitting under that tree with that nice long gray beard, he said, sir, uh, maybe you didn't understand me the first time. He said, I I want you to show me the, the way to success. How do I get to success? Show me the road to success. The older gentleman still gave him that blank stare didn't say anything, 
and did this. So the young man obeyed, and he went that same direction. After he went that same direction, after a few moments, the only thing that could be heard even more loudly this time was splat. So the younger gentleman came back. He stood before the man. This time he had bruised knees, and he was beginning to bleed from his legs. And this time the young man was irate. He said, sir, I told you to show me the way to success. I need to know the road to success. Why aren't you saying anything? Why don't you talk? Speak up. And then finally, the older man sitting under that tree with that long gray beard opened his mouth. And here's what he said. He said, the road to success is that way, but it's right after the splat. You see, some people don't fail. They just quit too quickly. And some Christians don't necessarily fail. They just give up too quickly. Perseverance may at times be grueling and hard, but the fruits of it are absolutely sweet. Press on. Let us pray. Our Father, we pray that you would help us to do exactly that. Help us to press on by your grace. Timothy was not in an easy situation. He was young. And he had to deal with false teachers who were older than, than him and probably treated him with disrespect, probably treated him in ways that we may not even have revealed to us in Scripture. Nevertheless, Paul tells Timothy to persevere and press on pursuing the right things and fighting this battle faithfully. And I pray that you would help us to do the same today. Help me to do that in my own life. And I pray that every individual believer in Hope Community Church would, de would do the same. We need your help. We need your grace. I pray for anybody who may be experiencing a hard time right now. Lord, hard times are, hard times are always upon us. Either we're coming out of a hard time or we're going into one. Somebody who's struggling right now, someone who wants to quit right now, I pray that you would come alongside them and encourage them with these words of scripture. I pray that they would seep deep into their souls and I pray that they would not quit. I pray that they would press on. I pray that they would remember their relationship with you. I pray that they would be revived once again in their souls to pursue the relationship that you brought about through the death of your son on Calvary's cross. And I pray that we all as your people would continue to press on until we see the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. Lord, heal broken hearts, encourage discouraged believers, and give us the strength to do what we need to do to be faithful to you. These things we ask in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.